We're going to work on a single, excuse me, two-strand braid this morning. I saw that y'all had got the three-strand ones. This can be done on the whole head or just in portions, and it's called the fish tail. It's a little more simple than holding three strands in your hand. You just section off of whatever you want to braid. Comb it smooth. Divide it to two strands. Cross one over the other. We're going to always add to the bottom strand, but we're going to add it from the top. Come in. Get the hair that you're going to add. Cross it over the top. Now we're going to add to the next to the top strand again. But we're going to add from the top. It's on the bottom and we're going to add from the top. And you can see what this begins to do for it. This is the one braid that does better if it's loose. Because it will give the appearance of the fish bones. Whenever you eat a fish and leave all the bones of the back and then it comes down and flares out into the tail. But I'm adding to the next to the top strand, but I'm adding to the top. And this is really pretty when it's done on the whole head and then flare it out. So you can always tell which one you're adding to. you just continue. When you get to the ends of the hair, you can um, go into your regular plait, three-strand braid, or you can, with shorter hair, you can let it flare out just like the fish tail looks. It's so either way you want to do, but once you get through, you want to loosen it up, and it gives you the effect of being woven in and then just complete either way you want to. I usually like to go into the three strand plait. Just one over the other, over the other. This is really long hair, but I like to go down until I get a section to leave out, and I usually do leave some out unless I'm going to tuck under. I leave a little bit out, put a rubber band on it, and then flare it. You see how it favors? All right, that's your two, two strand or fish tail. Now we want to finish our lecture so we can get our written part out of the way. I've laid a couple of things out here to have to go with writing because sometimes our client does not have enough hair and we add in. This is a real inexpensive fiber. It's sometimes used for what they call stuffing. When you got a French twist, it's not big enough. You'll use some of the braid. This is like $1.19 for a pack of it. But when you open it, you can pull out the strands, and if we wanted her braids to be bigger, like with cornrows, or she had real short hair, and we wanted the, the braids to be longer, like the dreadlocks or whatever, we would add some of this hair and put the length we wanted to, and we would braid it right in with the braid. We'd just start picking it up with the hair and braiding it in and adding the length on. All right. First thing we want to do is analyze hair. Some hair does a little better when you braid if you will spritz some water on it. But we have to be real, real careful about having it damp because what happens with damp hair is stretches more than dry hair. And if we have it damp and then braid it up and it dries and we've braided it real tightly, then it's going to be real uncomfortable for the client. And that's why you'll notice sometimes when you see people with braids, they'll have something in their hand and dig in it and knock on their head, they're trying to get rid of that tightness that's pulling on their scalp. So we want to analyze the hair, find out whether it's uh, the diameter of it, whether it's coarse, medium, or fine, the feel of it. And y'all told me yourself this morning that this felt so s slick. And it um, braids well because it doesn't tangle as we pull a section from it and change 
add hair to it. So is it oily, dry, hard, soft, smooth, coarse, or wiry? And this is not fine hair. It's smooth, but did you notice the texture of it's a little bit coarse, meaning it has a bigger diameter. Also, the wave pattern or coil configuration, whether it's straight, wavy, or coiled. And if it's got a wave pattern, it is best to braid with the wave pattern so we're not pulling against a growth pattern. Remember, in permanent waving, we said we never roll those rods against the growth pattern because it would cause the hair to break. The same thing will occur with a braid. And you'll notice often this hair, and this, unlike the mannequins y'all have, does have a follicle slope. It, all the hair doesn't stick out, and that's another reason it does so well. And you can actually notice the follicles. But if we were to take this, since the follicle is growing downward, and we would pull this in a real tight braid, we're pulling against the growth, and it would cause some hair damage or stretch that would be unhealthy for the hair. So you want to go with the flow of the hair when you're adding. You also want to check your facial shapes. Braids are not for everybody. Okay? If you've got somebody with a real long face and it's narrow, the last thing you want to do is, it's all right to have the top flat, but if you put these on the sides really flat, it makes their face look more longer and more narrow, especially if you add the length to the braids. So watch their facial shapes. It is said that the oval facial shape is considered to be the perfect facial shape, and the oval facial shape should be one and one half times as long as it is wide. And then you envision the other facial shapes, what would make them look oval. So you envision your oval there, and then if you've got a round face, you see what you need to get rid of. And what is the difference in a round face and an oval face? A round face would be shorter, right? So we want to add some length. We do that with height on top. A round face would also be wider on the sides than an oval face. <clears throat> so we would want to make the sides flat to the head to take that width away. What is the difference in an oval and a square? Square has corners at the chin line and at the forehead line. So you want to make sure some of your braids or whatever comes over those corners and give the appearance of oval. And so with the diamond shaped face, with diamond we've got sharp points here and sharp points here. So the last thing we want to do is pull all the hair back off of it showing the diamond shape. Usually faces do not fall into one category unless they are oval. And when I say that, I'm talking about you'll have a person with an oval face, but very seldom will you see a square face. You might see a square chin line with an oval forehead or vice versa. Most faces are combination unless they are ovals. But do take a look at their face. And if you notice your illustrations in your book, some of them showed height in the crown or top, and that's to keep from elongating somebody's face, facial shape. First thing we want to do is talk about the tools for braiding. And it really doesn't take a lot of tools to braid, but we do want our brushes because we want the hair out smooth. And different people prefer different things. I notice most of y'all like the paddle brush, and they are all the rage now as they were about 12 or 15 years ago when they first came out. I prefer a bristle brush because a bris bristle brush is really better about stimulating the scalp if you're needing, you know, if you feel like their hair is not as healthy as it should be. It always helps to stimulate the scalp a little bit to get the blood circulation flowing and remove any dust and debris or uh, flakes that might be there or loose scalp. The vent brush is really good. Um, I call it the comb brush because actually it's made kind of like combs are, but it will get the tangles out. But it's more developed to be used on wet hair, and that when they were first manufactured or discovered, that's what they were meant to do. If it's wet and you want to get tangles out, you can use it. And the book uh, mentioned double teeth combs, and that's what this is. You'll notice there's a row of teeth on each side of it. It's also good to get tangles out. When I trained, they taught us that you combed dry hair and br excuse me, you brushed dry hair and combed wet hair. 
So we never put a comb in dry hair, you know, not to come from here down. We would section off with our combs, and then we would get the knots out of the ends with the combs. But when we were coming through the strand, we always went back to our brushes to come through the strand. And I'm not saying that's the law now, but if you were to, um, you see how the comb catches them worse. If you were to use this bristle brush on wet hair, it's going to stretch it, and it's going to stretch it a whole lot more than what is healthy for the hair. So make sure you got the right tools. This was developed for use on dry hair. So we have our boar bristle brush. I don't have any of them in here because they're like 6 and $7 a piece now. And if you put them in brush delight to dissolve the hair out of them, remember boar bristle is natural bristles, meaning it didn't come off of a human, but it's hair off of some type of animal. So all of our brush delight is just going to dissolve the hair out of it, all of it. We're going to wind up with just a handle left when we got through. So we always have to hand clean those and not put them in brush delight. All right, we have the square paddle brush, and that's something like this. A lot of people um, like the oval better, and then we have the big square one too. <coughs> the vent brush, wide tooth comb. And y'all know that our regular styling comb comes with wider teeth on one end than it does the other. So, you know, if you want to use this fine, I do like the wide teeth on this better than I do that to get tangles out when the hair is wet. It has a tendency to pick them out if you'll stop at the ends and then comb through. Our tail comb, I like to keep one of these around when I'm doing anything with hair because if I want a straight line, that tail comb helps me get the straight line wherever I want to put it. It'll divide it off for me. So I always like the tail comb and it helps you get even sections also. The double tooth comb, we saw that, the finishing comb. Oftentimes when you're braiding, as you get further in on it, you may want to keep a little spritz or spray on it and have a comb that you can comb through. And even as you braid, you may want to take your comb as you've added hair to the other and comb it through so that you'll get smooth. If you'll notice when you start the braiding, you're going to see some hairs that want to get out of place and hump up in your braid. You can take your finishing comb and comb them smooth. Your cutting comb, a pick with rounded teeth is sometimes used. Blow dryer with a pick nozzle, and it looks like it's got teeth on the end of it. And I don't know why that was put in, in um, braiding, other than if you're going to shampoo and blow dry it first and comb it out smooth, the pick helps. Some other things, and this is what I was showing you a while ago that we might need if we're going to do extensions, and extensions are often done with braids. We're going to need some extension material, and we need to be familiar with whether it's cancalon, nylon synthetic, rayon synthetic, or human hair. We would know if it's yarn. Yarn is getting to be real popular with putting in the hair now, and that's yarn just like you crochet or knit with, and it's put in there. And sometimes it's used in colors close to their hair, not as a, an adornment, but just as a thickness. But you got to know whatever you're putting in their hair because some of these... Um, Synthetics, if you put the curling iron in there, it's going to melt. And if you've got it intertwined with their hair, it's going to melt onto their hair. So make sure you read and know what's, um, it tells you back here too. Mix mild shampoo and cool water, swish back and forth to clean it, gently rinse in cool water. When completely dry, brush it into the style that you'd like it to be in. So it kind of gives you a hint. It tells you it's 100% synthetic fiber. So this probably would not lend itself very well to a hot curling iron. Some of the synthetics you can put the curling iron in without melting it. But you need to know what it is because the last thing you want to do is braid somebody's hair and have all these lengths mixed in with it and put the curling iron on the ends to put a little body to it and melt that fiber in their hair. You also may get a hackle, and it's just a board with looks like a lot of nails on it where you can pull this smooth. That's not, you don't necessarily have to have that, but it helps you to divide it. Usually if you peel this off the side, it'll come right off. Materials for extensions. 
Human hair, naturally that's the best you can get because it goes right in with their hair. It's human hair. You can wash it, leaving the braids in, wash it, condition it, put the curling iron in it, blow dry it, whatever you do to human hair. But needless to say, it's the most expensive. It's also hard to match to their hair color because usually no two people have exactly the same hair color. We have a different blend. But that is the, uh, the choice if we can afford whatever we want. Cancalon is a manufactured synthetic fiber of excellent quality. Has a texture similar to extremely curly or coiled hair types. You notice this has its wave pattern. This is not straight hair. You can see the, the wave pattern to it. And that's probably something like Cancalon. Nylon or rayon synthetic is less expensive than cancalon. It's available in varying qualities. It reflects light and leaves the hair very shiny. The drawback of that is that they've been known to cut or break the hair. So it's a lot stronger fiber than the hair is. And if we pull it real tight, it just cuts the hair in two. If you notice with some threads, if you'll wrap them around your finger and pull it tight, it will cut into your hand. And that's what they're talking about. What it actually does, just cut into the hair till it cuts it off. We have the yarn, and like I said, that's just the same yarn that's made, uh, that's used in crocheting and knitting. Needless to say, it's strong, but it's a softer fiber, so it wouldn't be as apt to cut the hair. But it's not going to comb real good or brush real good once you get it in the hair. We also have lin, which is a beautiful wool fiber imported from Africa. has a matte finish, meaning it doesn't have a lot of shine, and it only comes in brown and black. <coughs> It's often used in the corkscrew braid styles that you usually don't shampoo. So you want to remember that. Is this client going to be shampooing regularly? Then we have yak. And some of our mannequins actually contain yak hair. It comes from the domestic ox. It's found in the mountains of Tibet and Central Asia. It's shaved and processed to use alone or either blended with human hair. And in a lot of wigs, it's blended with the human hair on the wig. A small mixture of yak with human hair helps to remove the manufactured shine. So do we work on wet hair or do we work on dry hair when we're braiding? Dry or at the most damp. If you're doing a single braid just at the bottom or a plait, you may make it wet. A lot of people with real long hair like to do that. You know, just dry it out just a little bit and then put the plait in it sleep in it that night to let it dry and then the next morning they take it down and just brush it out because it leaves real pretty braids but we do if we're going to do anything with dampness or wetness on there we want to remember the law that dry hair will stretch one fifth or twenty percent of its length and return and that's normal healthy hair normal healthy wet hair will stretch fifty percent of its length and return so if we've put a lot of stretch on that hair and braided it our clients gonna become real uncomfortable when they get dry now, you saw the visible braid and the invisible French braid and all this good stuff the other day, so we need to go over it, make sure we understand the difference. A visible braid is a three-strand braid that employs the underhand technique in which the strands of hair are woven under the center strand. An invisible braid or inverted braid is also the three-strand braid, is produced by overlapping the strands on uh, top of each other. The rope braid is made with two strands that are twisted around each other. It can be done on hair that is all one length as well as on long layered hair. You're going to run up with a question after a while about whenever you are braiding hair, do you twist as you go over? And what we're talking about with that is, uh, especially with your French braid, when you take it over, should you give a little twist to it? And the answer to that would be yes. And the reason you'd give a little twist, it, with this it doesn't matter because this is all one length. But when you get somebody that's had their hair layered, that little twist as you go over gets, catches the ends up in it and makes it smoother. And sometimes that would be when you'd want to mist a little water on there too is when you've got layered hair so that it will dry having been twisted. So if you get that question somewhere, should I twist? As I braid the hair, the answer is going to be yes, because you want to um, 
make sure it lays smooth and we don't have ends sticking out our braids everywhere. The fishtail braid we just demonstrated is a simple two-strand braid in which hair is picked up from the sides and added to the strands as they are crossed over each other. It's best done on dry, non-layered hair. And remember with it, because it's really easy, but it's confusing of how you do because you usually add to the hair you're going to take over, but with fishtail, you have already taken it over and you add to the bottom side of it. Single braids, box braids, and individual braids all refer to free hanging braids with or without extensions that can be executed with either an underhand or overhand technique. And y'all saw that. You may put extensions in for the single braids. Cornrows. The fundamentals of braiding start with the classic cornrow technique. They may also be called cane rows. They are narrow rows of visible braids that lie close to the scalp. It's nice to learn to cornrow because that's where you're going to sew in hair. If you've got a sheath of hair that needs sewing in, you put a cornrow here and put it up there and sew it in. Several different techniques for sewing in. You can also feed it in with the um, cornrows. Locks, and this is actually where the term dreadlocks come from, and it's where hair actually locks around each other. It grows in the coiled form and then is twisted later on. But locks, also called dreadlocks, are natural textured hair that is intertwined and meshed together to form a single or separate network of hair. The hair locking is actually done without any type of chemical. When we get into uh, 111, we study the fusion method of adding hair but this is not fused. This is actually locking the hair itself. Um, if you go to the Caribbean, you'll see a lot of dreadlocks or locks. And also you'll see a lot of artificial ones hanging there for you to purchase that, you know, that can just be attached. There's three basic methods of locking. The comb method, method is used during the early stages of locking before the coil gets real tight. We have the palm method where they actually roll the locks. And then the braids or extension starts the locks. And the stages of lock are the pre-lock stage. This is where hair is soft and coiled into spiral configurations. The sprouting stage is the hair begins to interlace and mesh with each other. The growing stage, which is a bulb, can be filled at the end of each lock. Interlacing continues, and now you see more length. Maturation stage, the lock is totally closed at the end, and then the atrophy stage, and any time we see atrophy, we know that stuff is wasting away or going away on us. So after several years of maturation, the lock may start to weaken and come apart at the ends. All right, do we have questions? Okay.